A while ago, I was invited to give a keynote talk um, for a college in Tallinn, uh, Estonia, that was celebrating 80 years of educating nurses. Um, and I thought some of the issues that um, came up in that talk to do with nurse education and professionalism and the link between the two would make a good topic for this um, Scholars at Work session. If I needed any reminding, I realised again that one of the issues facing nursing in different ways worldwide has been its aspiration for professional standing and its struggle with the forces of, let's say for now, of social conservatism. A force that still in 2020 sees women's roles, and most nurses are women, as being subservient to men or less valuable than men's. This kind of patriarchy and sexism features across the political spectrum, from left to right. And in an era of the so-called strong man political leader, sexist attitudes to women may well become exaggerated. But I want to argue in this talk that perhaps it's not too optimistic to think of the rise in influence of nurses and nursing as a positive force for public health across the world. This isn't a new point, but perhaps worth thinking about today in 2020, in a world where, in the United Kingdom at least, during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, the public was encouraged to applaud nurses while the government voted against valuing their work more highly in terms of their pay. I took the title for this talk from an interview I held with the chief nurse in the English Department of Health. She was the most senior civil servant representing nursing. I interviewed her in her office in early 2012 and the recording is punctuated by the chimes of Big Ben. We talked shortly after the media had featured some high profile scandals involving poor nursing care. And she told me this, what politicians want is any sort of quick answer to a problem. They have to be seen to be doing something. These magic bullets like, if only we didn't educate nurses, if only nurses were more stupid. Nursing is the only profession, she told me, where being more intelligent is seen as some sort of hindrance. To think about nurses and nursing, let's start by reminding ourselves about what's at stake for an occupation that wants to think about itself and establish itself as a profession. Early studies of the professions emphasize what I suppose you'd call their positive features uh, and the key, their key role in the operation of the state. So these features would be something like this. Their possession and development of high levels of specialist knowledge, that this would be formalized in high level training, controlled by the profession itself, and that this training is the only way to gain access to the profession. Formal regulation, that is policing of the standards and behavior of its members, self-regulation, but more recently state regulation. A high degree of control over their own work and sometimes the work of other occupational groups. And altruism, a kind of moral commitment to the welfare of their clients, coupled with a kind of detached and even-handed objectivity. Sociologists who have examined the professions have been fascinated by medicine as a classic profession. And you can see these features that I've just mentioned appear to fit medicine pretty well. Nursing's professionalizers in the late 19th century and far more recently have set out to copy certain of these features. More of that later. But you can consider this, the features I listed just now, 
an uncritical understanding of the forces at work in the professions. In fact, you can consider this apparent generalization, the attempt to answer the grandiose question, what are the characteristics of the professions? More of a description of a small number of groups, middle class men, in a particular time period and in only one or two actual countries. It gives rise also, as an aside, to descriptions of the so-called semi-professions. These comprise, supposedly, nursing, teaching and social work. Surprise, surprise, all occupations with large proportions of women. However, writers like Magali Larson and many others from the 1970s onwards started to explore in detail how these professions actually operated and how they gained and maintained professional and social status and power. These authors give us a description of professional organisation that is slightly less positive and certainly more complex. They use terms like occupational closure, describing the work that an occupation does to draw a line around an area of work and keep others out and if they're really successful get this reinforced by the state. So for example you could end up in prison if you work claiming to be a doctor when you are not. And this way of examining the professions explores the link between knowledge and power, particularly the knowledge associated with the university and professional status. So you can see why it is so fundamentally undermining to a professional project when politicians and parts of the media start to say that the problem with nurses is that they are over-educated. But the fact that nursing has emulated the classic behaviour of the high prestige professions has caused nursing certain problems. I'll come back to this. I want to mention now work that has looked at gender and the professions as clearly this is important if we're thinking about nursing. Nursing's professional project in the 19th and early 20th centuries was about gaining a monopoly over its services in the face of the patriarchal forces of medicine. Its long campaign for registration in England delivered control over the supply of nurses by including only those who had gone through a particular system of education and excluding anyone else. In other words, what could be described as a credentialist claim for nursing work. That is, you need a particular credential to enter and be a nurse. The aim of this campaign was that registration would give nursing self-government instead of the subjugation of nurses by medical men. Their success shows that women can mount effective challenges to patriarchal systems and these challenges can liberate women from the label of semi-professionals. But it has not been completely successful in two ways. First, Many unqualified and lesser qualified workers continue to do the work that could be understood as nursing work. And second, nurses themselves engage in duties that could be considered as supporting or auxiliary work. The border between medical and nursing work is certainly more and more fluid, but the character of skill and knowledge in nursing and the link between the two remains hard to define and this vagueness can be exploited by the state and local managers by redefining grades and by the creation of new grades of worker who are quicker to train and cheaper to employ and who appear 
to do identical tasks to those done by qualified nurses. But nursing still faces a dilemma in its professionalizing project. That is, to reconcile the apparently stereotypical gendered male character of the classic professional, the person who can dispassionately and objectively weigh up alternatives and not be swayed by emotion or personal concerns, with the highly embodied and emotionally engaged nature of care work done overwhelmingly by women. You could say that nursing needs to develop and present a new version of what it is to be a professional. This professional is both able to draw on evidence in making complex decisions and is orientated toward a person-centered commitment to planning and delivering finely tuned embodied care. So one criticism, if that is the best word, of healthcare delivery has been the self-serving tendencies of the powerful professions. But there have been other criticisms from the right of the political spectrum. These concern what you could call a neoliberal critique of the lack of incentives and motivation inherent, so they argue, in a state-run, centralised monopoly system. This kind of critique was at work, I think, when newly post-communist states reconsidered the design of their healthcare systems. Although Soviet-style healthcare featured universal access, and compare that to the United States, and central planning, it was widely seen in practice as inefficient, with too much hospital capacity and too many doctors and not exactly patient-centred. Part of the problem is that traditional professional demarcations, that is the separation of the type of work done by each professional group, is also inefficient and can lead to patients having to attend multiple appointments or to fragmented care. With those ideas I mentioned earlier about the central part played by high-level education in any professionalizing project, you can see that the history of nurse education around the world both reflects and shapes the status and character of the profession. So I want to end with some thoughts about nurses and influence. I said in the abstract that university level education, along with supportive professional networks and access to, and if you're lucky, mentoring from people in established senior positions, can allow nurses to move into policy influencing roles. I think we can see from the history of nursing that not having this credential can bar you from so many important places. But what you can actually gain from higher education at its best is far more than a qualification or technical knowledge. Here are some of the things that I'd like to think that you can gain. They're very obvious, but it's worth reminding ourselves about them. Number one, becoming able to set out and defend your viewpoint about a particular topic or course of action through participating in robust debate so you don't take it personally when people disagree with you. Two, being able to understand, not be intimidated or confused by data and statistics and use them when making decisions and justifying them. Three, looking out beyond your professional group to understand the issues facing others and the terminology that they use. Also how different groups understand the same phenomenon. It can broaden the mind. Four, having some understanding 
of academic disciplines such as sociology or psychology and use some of their key concepts when thinking about situations or solving problems. Five, questioning and critiquing your own beliefs, even those that are deeply held. Six, understanding the structure and operation of health systems from government downwards and not just your own experience of it and being able to link these two. And finally, getting access to leaders in nursing and in healthcare, perhaps as visiting lecturers. Very lastly, I just want to ask, why is this a good thing? I think we can consider the effect of nurse education as having the potential to advance social change. First, because it can bring relatively disempowered groups, such as women, and those from less privileged class and minority ethnic backgrounds into these positions of influencing policy. And second, if nurses genuinely advocate for their patients and clients, and these might include various marginalised groups, such as the elderly or those with mental health problems or drug users, they may be able to act as a force for social justice. So I hope you found that um, uh, interesting and I hope you agree that um, the issues that it raises are something that's relevant for us. Um, perhaps we could um, spend the rest of the time we've got uh, discussing maybe some of the issues that it, was, uh, that it raised.